Okay, so welcome back. This is going to be part two in my uh, my approach to creating a campaign or starting a campaign. If you missed the first part, I'll have a link down in the description. Basically, in that one, I talked about the approaches to designing a campaign, uh, for, you know, whether that's from top down or from bottom up, as I do. Uh, the goals I have uh, when I'm kind of putting a campaign together for the first time, the role that the first session plays or session zero and creating characters and connecting them to each other, and then how asking questions and using their answers can help you connect players to each other and to different elements in the world. What I want to do here in the second part is actually walk through an example and just kind of walk you through my thought processes if I were doing this right now. And in fact, um, what I'm going to do is I just want you to kind of imagine that I've got friends over and everybody is here for the session zero. They're actually creating characters right now. They've got blank character sheets. They're deciding what they want to play and they're talking amongst themselves. Well, I'll play the barbarian. I'll play the fighter. They're kind of working that stuff out. I technically don't need no don't need to have anything started until that point. When they're starting to make their characters, I can start this process. Now, there's some elements here I'm going to talk about that I typically have done beforehand, whether it was the night before or a week before. There's some things I will do um, before that, but technically I could do these right then as they're making characters. So let's talk about that. And and what what I kind of want you to also consider here is this is what I what I look at as my minimum. This is kind of what I need in order to get a session started. So these are these are just the minimal things I work on uh, leading up to us actually you know rolling dice and saying cool let's play. So there's kind of four key elements here. Um, first of all, and that is that I need a place for them to start. Now, I'm, I'm going to say a town for this example. I need a place for them to be when we start the game. So I'm going to say town, but this could be sometimes I've started players in the middle of an encounter, or things like that, or so often some weird location. But for this instance, we're going to say a town. I need a town. I need maybe an NPC or two or three that I think may be kind of prominent. And I may have to kind of come back to this as I flesh out some other stuff first. I need to know the surrounding area around the town. I need to know what's around it geographically speaking. And then I need some points of interest out there as well. So those are kind of the four things I'm going to be trying to iron out uh, as, as for example, the players are working on their characters and everything. So jumping back into the town, one of the things I do like to do, and this may be something that I do, you know, the day before, um, if I've got that much time, I can browse the internet and look at town images. For me, that's a really cool place to start. If I'm going to start in a town, I like to go to somewhere like DeviantArt and, you know, search through the fantasy um, digital art and search for something like town or city and just kind of look through those. And I'm a very visual person, so I like to see that. And then my mind goes crazy when I see it. I'm like, oh, that's really cool. That gives me tons of ideas. I, I, I like that. And I may even save that to show the player. So I need a town. And part of that is, of course, I need a name for that town. And this I may know all right off the bat. Um, in my current campaign, I called it Goldcrest. That was something I came up with pretty quickly. Um, or I may have to kind of think about some of the surrounding area and some other things before I lock down a name. Um, one of the other things I may need to come back to is I want to know what this town does. What's its purpose? What purpose does it serve? say the kingdom or the area that it's in what does it do for people here and also as part of that i like to think about what things you are likely to see if you walk through the town from one side to the other so those are kind of three things the name what they do and things you're likely to see there and again some of these i may need to skip and work on like the surrounding areas and points of interest then maybe some npcs and then i might know okay this is kind of what the city or the town does so when it comes to npcs um, it's kind of the same thing. I like to think of maybe who's prominent in this town. The town may have some kind of large building. You know, the image I may get inspired by, maybe it has some tower. And I'm like, oh, I really like this. And there's a tower. You know what? I'm going to make an NPC. And who, maybe they're like a scholar in that tower. So I want a couple NPCs to potentially tie players to. Or that I know that I may kind of um, have them run into during that first session for one reason or another. The surrounding area... Uh, is the third one, and I like to know what's really within the first few days of travel. What what's what would you call this area, for example, to the north? In this case, I might think of the town and say, you know what, I like the idea of mountains to the north, and to the east, maybe a lake, and maybe I even saw a lake in the image of the town, maybe not. Um, to the south, let's say plains, and to the west, a forest. A forest would be good. So we've got mountains, lake, 
plains, and forests. That's kind of the area around the town. The fourth point was points of interest. And for that, I kind of want to think of some fun um, or very interesting, intriguing, mysterious, you know, things that I feel may draw players to it. Um, I may brainstorm this again, kind of while the characters are putting stuff together or whether it was the night before, I may brainstorm out a couple ideas like an obelisk, a crater, some ruins, a submerged structures, or, you know, maybe a small village that's now underwater. I'll kind of list a bunch of these out and then try to narrow that down to like five of them or something that I think are cool. I don't need to know anything about them. I just want to think of like what would be a cool, if I imagine my player standing near it. That's usually how I operate, and I go, okay, I like the idea of an obelisk somewhere and a crater somewhere. That's cool. So I'll note those. Now, once I've gone through this and I've kind of got some of these ideas down, um, I do keep in the back of my mind the uh, stuff surrounding that, and that's both a literal thing and also just kind of a general concept. What I mean by that is I've talked about what's to the north, the south, the east, and the west nearby. Beyond that, I kind of see that as a cloud. It's kind of, it's open. There's like a fog, right? Um, what's beyond that? I don't necessarily need to know, um, but we may discover that in, in play. In fact, I may have questions that I ask of the players where that starts to get answered um, if we need it. Or a player may say, well, what's beyond the mountains to the north? I may actually ask them, well, what do you think, dwarf? You're from the mountains in the north, as you've said. You tell me what's on the other side. Is it a sea or is it, uh, you know, just more mountains? Like, you know, and so they may help figure that out. And then that cloud in my mind is revealed and I may note that real quick in my notes. Fleshing out the world of the players again. So that's the that's the literal translation of kind of this cloud. If you're visualizing this, there's the cloud around there. There's also the general concept where I'm not talking literally about what's on the other side of the mountains. It could be, for example, the gods. Um, or it could be, is this part of a larger kingdom? That's kind of in the cloud of ideas out there. And so a lot of that stuff, as I'm fleshing this out, I'm keeping things in mind as possibilities so that if for some reason something comes up, it's easier for me to remember. For example, if I think, man, beyond the woods to the west, it might be cool if there was like a big canyon. That might be kind of cool. I like the idea visually of the forest stopping at this like canyon, you know, maybe if you think of the Grand Canyon, right? Something like that. But I don't necessarily write that down, but I, I've thought of that so that if the players ask, I might just throw that out and say, well, beyond that, you've actually heard there is a canyon. Um, or if I'm just don't really have anything, let's say they say, well, what's south of um, the plains to the south? Um, then I may actually turn that around as a question to one of the players. You kind of see where I'm going with this. It's, I think of the outer rims of knowledge um, and, and kind of think of some ideas so that I could go there. It helps with improv that kind of stuff. If a player asks something and I've thought about it before, it comes to me really quickly. Um, so I'm always kind of keeping those things in mind. Now, once I've got some of these things I've talked about down, I know what's in the surrounding area. I know some points of interest and everything. I may go back to the town at this point and say, you know what? We're going to call this city um, or this town foothold. It's kind of, there's nothing else around. The way I've kind of laid things out, I think, geographically, it's out here by itself. So we'll call it that. What do they do here? Well, there's a lake, so it makes sense that they do a lot of fishing. Um, that would be key. There is mountains, so there's probably mining going on. So, okay, cool. That's that kind of helps me narrow things down to what's kind of going on in this town. And the third part of the town one, again, kind of going back to it was, you know, what are you likely to see walking through the town? I'm a, a visual person, as I said. So in this case, I think, okay, there's probably carts moving back and forth, hauling loads of fish, right? They're on the lake. So that's really big. There's probably a number of masons in this town. Um, you know, a lot of stonework and everything. Um, so that's definitely a possibility. Um, of something you would see regularly. I'm looking for the things that if you were to drop somebody in the middle of town, you'd say there's a very high percent chance you would see what, or you would overhear what. And so you might overhear Masons talking about this new project they're working on, or you may hear sailors complaining about the winds on the lake today, things like that. They help me flesh out the town. And I want to have those things to go to when I first bring the players here. I don't want to tell them it's a big city with a bunch of buildings and roads. I want to describe what's going on around them and they'll realize that, oh, this is a fishing town. Got it. And I don't, I don't want to just say it's a fishing town. So again, very visual. I'm trying to think of, of those kinds of things. Now, what I want to do 
at this point, once, once I've got all these kind of loose things down and, and, the, and the players are sitting here at the table and their characters are getting fleshed out, I'm listening to, listening to that as I go and I may pick up on some things. There, there may be a character that says, oh, I, I'm going to make a rogue and man, it'd be cool if I was like in some kind of guild, but I'm not really sure. They may be telling another player that and that starts to trigger ideas for me too. Like, oh man, maybe that tower in town... Um, people think it's a scholar, but maybe that's actually a guild leader, you know, to this like thieves guild or something. He's wealthy and he uses that as his base of operations or something. So I'm kind of th using what they're talking about to kind of flesh out some ideas as well. Um, but I do want to start asking the players questions, right? I talked about this in the first part, the leading questions or multiple choice, kind of posing things to them to help so that they can kind of help me flesh things out. Now, if I leave it open-ended, these questions, and say, hey, you know, what do you think this building would be for? That could be a bit too much. Again, I talked about that, trying to narrow down some of their options, why I say like leading questions. So let me walk through some examples here. So I've got what we've got here, what I've kind of explained to you so far. And at this point, we can imagine that the players know what they're going to play. Um, they know that there's going to be a rogue, a fighter, a ranger, and a wizard. I know their races. They, you know, they may not have much more than that. Um, but I'm going to start asking them questions right now and I'm going to start tying them to things because it's going to help them to maybe decide on some of their skill choices, for example, or powers. So to give an example, I may look and say, well, I've got woods to the west. I, I know that. I think that's going to be a cool thing. So I may actually um, ask the ranger at this point. Um, you know, say one of them is an elf ranger going to be playing that. I say, hey, um, you know, there's a forest uh, west of the town. And uh, oftentimes from the town of Foothold here, um, they actually, you know, hunters like to go out there. But as a ranger, you you know, a lot of rangers actually are paid to guide people out on these, you know, hunting expeditions and things like that. Is that something you would have done before? And the player can answer, you know, oh, yeah, definitely. That's probably why I have some of the money that I have now is I've been paid to do that. Or the ranger may say, I actually don't like the idea of just taking people out from the town to kill animals and everything. I may hunt. And, but that's because I'm going to use every piece of the animal and everything, but I'm not out there to like take people out to, you know, help them kill things in the woods. I'd like to keep people out of the woods, for example. And so you kind of work with them on that and say, oh, okay, so, so you wouldn't really guide people. Um, and, and, you know, I may turn that in a different direction and say, well, um, you did say you're an elf and there are elves, um, you know, known to be in these woods. And I may have just come up with that right then. Right, right off the top of my head. So then I may ask him, are you from that area? And he may say, well, I hadn't thought about it. But yeah, sure, that's probably why I'm in this town, is it's in close vicinity, and sometimes I come into this town, to which I might continue my line of questioning and say, oh, great, okay, well, is it a you know, a large civilization of elves? Like, do you think that's, or do you know, do you imagine you come from this like large populace of, you know, or this large population of elves in the woods? Or is this kind of like a smaller, you know, group? Tell me about the subclass you chose, for example, or, you know, if you haven't, like, let's try to flesh that out. So anyway, we start to learn a bit more about that. The other players around the table start to hear that as well. It helps flesh the world out for them, and they may chime in with ideas too. For example, the wizard may say, oh, you know, that what's cool is if he's been to the woods before, maybe we know each other because I'm always out to like learn new things, and if elves are out there, there's probably some really interesting, maybe even magical things in the forest that I will have wanted to research. Now the ranger at that point may say, oh, well that I would guide someone on. Anything like educating people on the woods and everything, I'm all about that. Hunting, you know, helping other people hunt? No. But yeah, wizard, I would, I, I that's something I would totally be up for, you know. And so now they're starting to make these connections themselves. And that totally happens at the table. You see the players kind of working together, coming up with those things. But you can do those kinds of things as well. If that never happened, I might actually tell the wizard, you know, so what are you about? Are you, you know, trying to research things? Well, did you know there's, you know, known to be magical things in these woods? Um, so we're kind of going around the table and connecting people to this. So in this example, I've kind of connected the ranger to the forest. Um, I've connected the wizard to a ranger in a sense. But then I may also say, well, you know, there is an obelisk to the south. And I may just kind of come up with that as well and say, oh, the obelisk being in the middle of the plains, like nothing around it. That seems visually kind of cool, kind of stunning. Like, why is it here? And as I'm thinking of that, I may ask the wizard, well, you know, being a wizard and, and you studying, you know, things of a magical nature and everything, there's always been the question of, 
why is this obelisk in the plains? And so it would kind of make sense for wizards and, and people who study arcane things to have checked out that obelisk. Have you been out there before? And again, the wizard can say yes, they can say no, they can give you a third answer, you know, is something that they find really interesting. So at that point, you've connected the wizard to the obelisk. Even if they say no, nah, I don't think I've ever been out there before. I could say, okay, well, you have studied the arcane stuff, you know, and there's probably a maybe a school um, studying these things in this city, you know, are you a part of that? And he may say, oh yeah, that's where I learned. Okay, great. So you've probably heard of the obelisk right? Wizard says, yeah, yeah. I mean, I do pay attention to these things. I've just never been out there myself. Okay, great. So now that wizard has this connection. He understands a bit more about that part of the world. And in fact, later if we're playing and a question comes up, that wizard might say, you know, I haven't been out there, but have I heard anything about this in the school? You know, like um, our rogue is kind of wondering about that and can I roll like to, to, to see if I already know the answer to his question, because maybe I've run across this in my schooling before. So that's really the kind of stuff I'm, the reason I'm trying to connect people to a point of interest or to an area like the ranger to the woods or um, a person to an NPC. For example, if I connected the halfling rogue, let's say I might connect them to an actual, the thieves guild leader or something in town. We do that so that they feel like they have a connection uh, to the world. They kind of help shape it even. And also that it can come up immediately in the game. They feel like their character has been in the world for a while. Not that they've just been dropped in out of nowhere and they know nothing, which can happen a lot of times, especially in a campaign that you're building from the bottom up that really has no detail until it came into being during this session. So what I've just gone over is kind of the the minimum stuff I need to really begin working on when I've got players at the table. Again, some of the stuff I will have fleshed out maybe the day before. I may have already kind of determined the, the kind of town that it is and maybe the surrounding area. And then that might be it because I really want to wait and see what the players are going to do to flesh out the other ideas. But those are things that I can actually do at the table um, from nothing. Literally sit down and just, okay, I'm going to start taking notes and working on this stuff while they build their characters. So that's kind of the stuff that's happening right away. There is a couple things um, that I like to do maybe ahead of time. Um, I can do them here at the table and sometimes I do, um, but they just, I think they really help, especially with a setup like this um, for my improv basically uh, to help me improv things. One of them, the, the, the kind of main thing is a list of names, hugely uh, valuable to me. Um, I do have Xanathar's Guide to Everything, which has a nice list in the back of names, pages of names. That's awesome. Usually I go online and I find like a good list. I print it out and I've got the list in front of me. And as the players run into people, they're like, oh, what's your name? And then I look and just give them a name really quick. And then I kind of wait and see how the conversation goes with that person, the NPC. And if it feels like there might be a little bit more, like they may go back and meet this person later, I may make a note of them uh, myself. I just kind of jot the name down and then I'm like, you know, merchant or, uh, Mason, stuff like that. And I'll cross the name off the list. So I don't just go right back to it. You know, the next time somebody asks me a name and the players will take notes of these things too. So it's good for me to make sure I'm keeping track of those. Um, another thing that's good to kind of put together again, this can happen right at the table or it can happen beforehand is if I have, I have a general understanding of the surrounding area in a way I might want to take them in my mind. I might say, I know that I've got um, the area here surrounded by mountains, lake, plains, and a forest, but I really have this cool idea for an encounter that would happen in the forest. Um, we are leaving things really open so I can go with the flow of what the players want to do. But when we're talking about asking questions and using the answers and especially using like leading questions, we can point very easily in the first session and the first couple sessions, the players down a path. Now this is kind of like, it's kind of a railroading in a sense, um, which I definitely, my, I personally myself try to avoid. Um, there's merits for it, but it's just not something that I like to uh, do regularly. But in the beginning, I find it's very helpful for the players. If there's some kind of pretty clear direction, they latch onto that and go, oh, cool, here's what we're going to do. And I can kind of guide them with the, with the leading questions. And we talked about the leading questions before, um, connecting them. But once we really start to get established and we're, and I can tell things are about to get moving, 
um, that's when I can start heading them into a direction and can say, okay, well, we know this about the rogue and he's done the woods and, you know, been in the woods and he's guided the wizard out there to look for things. And you dwarf fighter, um, we talked about how you've actually used the ranger as well. He's escorted you to some areas too. Um, you were doing some things for the dwarves, um, and looking for some, you know, the special, you know, location in the plains or whatever. And the ranger took you out there to find something. So, you know, we could have established all these different connections. And when I already knew, let's say ahead of time that I wanted to do something in the woods, I can start guiding it there and say, okay, so based on everything we've said, um, and we know that the wizard is wanting to go back to the woods at some point, um, it would probably make sense that you would, you know, you ranger would probably have talked to the fighter, about, um, you know, hey, I'm going to be taking this wizard into the woods, but we're going into this place that I know is a little bit dangerous. Like, do you think that's something you'd be comfortable reaching out to the dwarf fighter to maybe go with you? You know, and so he may say yes or no. And if he says no, we can still work around that and say, he, well, I'm not very comfortable. I might say to the dwarf, then what about you? You know, you know, the ranger and, you know, sometimes he goes to dangerous places. Is this something you would have offered up to like help him during that? And, you know, what you'll find is players are happy to have those kinds of things because they're not great at kind of thinking of them themselves. So in that case, the the fighter, this dwarf fighter might say, yeah, oh yeah, if he ever, if, and then he may turn, actually turn to the ranger, if you ever need help with anything, you always let me know, you know where I'm at. And, and then the ranger may say, oh, okay, well in that case, if he's offered before, then yeah, I would have, you know, sure, I would definitely would have asked him before. And then the halfling rogue may chime in. Well, if they're going somewhere where there's something of value, I would want to be in on that. I'd say, okay, well, great. Yeah, the wizard is wanting to go investigate these caves that are somewhere deep in the forest. Um, and you know that, you know, there's a lot of valuable things to have come out of that forest before. It's considered a magical place. Um, so it would kind of make sense for you all to maybe be, you know, on your, you know, have, have left, right. To go into the woods and seek this place out. And they're all kind of nodding. And then at what point I might say, great. Okay. Well that three days ago you left town and you know, you've camped a couple times and, and it's the morning now, um, on the day that you expect to arrive at the caves, you know, you're in the middle of the woods, you put the fire out. But here you are, you're ready to go there, you know, and I may start to kind of explain some of the little things they've run into in the woods or maybe an encounter. Yeah, you fought off some goblins, you know, they're not too uncommon in these woods. Um, but, you know, here you are in this morning, you know, today's the day you intend on reaching the mine. So, you know, do you guys want to head out? Is there anything you want to do before you leave? And we just naturally just go right into the session, um, almost coming right out of character creation. You know, it's not, it can be that fluid is I guess what I'm getting at. And to kind of get back to a point I was starting to get to before I went down this path um, about leading, using the questions to kind of lead them into an area, I was talking about some prep ahead of time. I mentioned a list of names. The other thing that I want to try and have set up ahead of time is some encounters. Um, you know, thinking about the number of players, thinking about monsters of the right challenge rating. Um, I may come up with some of the stuff. Well, I know they're going to be in the woods and they're heading to mine. So, and I may come up with a couple different encounters. Um, and we may only have time to get to one and I may not even know which one exactly I will pull on them, but you know, they're, I know they're heading through the woods. So I could use one that's happens in the forest, or I could use one that happens maybe when they're in the mines, but they're here in front of me, usually on index cards, I'll write out, you know, hit points, AC, the abilities that they have, the hit points of some of these. And I can, that I can all work off of one index card for each encounter. So I got maybe two or three of those. And then I, we just play. And then, um, I may decide, Hey, it's kind of slow. I'm going to spring an encounter on them now, or they're just me. This may be this natural thing that occurs where the players are, for example, investigating and start to expect danger. And then, then I just may say, you know what, this is a good time for it for this particular encounter. I'm going to pull this right now because at session one, especially when you've spent a bunch of time building up, creating characters and everything, I typically don't have a lot of time to do a lot of encounters, but I do want to get one encounter in. Um, a lot of my games, there's a number of sessions I have where no combat occurs at all. Um, and my players are totally happy with that, but we do enjoy combat, right? This is D and D you want to roll dice, you want to kill things. And I do think that a combat encounter in the very first session is, it's not, um, 
required, but I do, for me, it's, it's really, it falls just short of being required. <laughs> I really want to get a combat encounter in because it really breaks the ice. Everybody gets a chance to try out their abilities during that very first session. And, you know, I don't know, for me, it's just kind of a, it's a given that we're going to have a combat encounter to try things out. So those, those are the two things again, like a list of names and a couple encounters that are kind of ready to go. And the way I get around building the encounters ahead of time is that I kind of know where I'm probably going to drive them initially, at least in that first couple steps out the gate. So that pretty much covers the start of a campaign for me. It's really light. It's really small. It's bottom up. We're really building from literally where the characters are and we'll spread out into the world and learn as we go, either by me having some idea um, and being able to answer the questions that they have or to reveal areas basically as they explore. Or if I'm feeling stumped or if I feel like it's a good opportunity to, I will turn around questions back on the players and say, I don't know, you tell me about this area. Uh, Ranger, you know about this. Or, you know, I don't know about this particular town cleric. Why don't you tell me your, uh, your church has definitely been out here before, you know, explored these areas. And there, there is actually a church to your God in this city. So, you know, what do you know of this place? Um, so I like to do that. Basically, that's how we explore and discover more about the world. Um, as we go. And so you can imagine that's just what happens beyond this first session. And really what I look to do after that first session ends is I look at where they're at and where they're likely to go. And I will start to kind of do my game prep for where I think they're going to be heading. Now, characters change directions, you know, they definitely can. And I, like I mentioned before, I don't want to railroad. So I just typically prepare for what I think is likely. And then I like to think about the possibilities. It kind of goes back to the cloud analogy, right? I think they're going to go this direction. So I'm going to make sure I maybe have some names and I've got a couple things written down. So I'm a little bit prepped for that. But then I like to think, okay, if they didn't do this, what would they do? Like, what's the next most likely? Okay, they may detour here and go south along this thing if they think this thing may happen. And I just want to think about it. And I won't write anything down. I'll just play it out in my mind. Well, then, then they would go down the river. And, oh, so there's probably, there'd be cool if there was a town there if they did that. Okay, cool, a town. And maybe a small town. And, okay, cool, this is probably what that town's about. Got it. And that's kind of locked away in my memory. So that if for some reason they do detour, um, that's played out in my mind already. So it just helps with me kind of improving everything else. Um, having that kind of this, the scenario, the, um, the surroundings, the setting kind of placed before me, I can fill in the details like right off the cuff. Um, and again, if, if I get stumped and, or I'm not sure that's a good opportunity to turn around and back on the players and help have them help you kind of build that out, connect them to the world. And um, that, that's pretty much it. That's really what I like to start with. And we expand out and the farther they go out, the farther my mind starts to go out and the possibilities of other kingdoms or things like that, again, to help me just be a little bit, you know, more ready to answer some questions if they come up. Uh, but that's how I've been enjoying my campaign building um, these days, the last number of times, just kind of coming up with it myself along with the players. And to be honest, that's a huge part of the enjoyment of D&D for me as a DM. If I had everything laid out and everything was super detailed, following the players and what they do is interesting, but there's a lot that's just known already. And I like to discover things as a, as a DM. I like to have that uncertainty at the table when I'm playing to say, I don't know where they're going to go. And if they go here, I, I don't even know what's over there yet you know, and their actions are going to kind of determine even um, how that's going to go. And to give you just one quick example as well, I actually had a character, an NPC, who in my mind was was a good guy, but he did bad things. So some people really consider him complicated. Um, I, I, and in my mind, I was like, he, he, I think he does more good than harm though. So his, the negative stuff that he does is typically forgiven. Well, the players, as it turns out from their point of view, they just disliked the guy and they were never going to trust him. And in fact, it was set at the table between each other. They were just like, I'm of the mind, like, I don't care if this guy has like saved kids and done this and that. I don't trust him. I hate this guy. I don't want to deal with him in ever. And in my mind, I thought that's interesting. Totally not quote unquote, what's really happening in the background, but you know what? We're going to roll with that. Now there's no sense of me banging my head against the wall saying, why don't you trust this guy? He actually can be trusted. No, he's going to be a bad guy now. 
because that's just like that's just kind of makes sense it's the way it's going it's going to be fun they've they've essentially built out an enemy a villain right and i can make a villain i can make a bad guy and say oh this is a bad guy and this is why you'll hate him and it could turn out that the players are just okay with him right and you're not going to change their mind so i wrote a i wrote an article a while back that was called um players create the best npcs and it's exactly because of that when you do this bottom-up approach and you flesh things out as you go they're the ones that will tell you through their actions who they fully trust and who they absolutely hate. And as much as you may try as a DM to plan that out and say, they're going to hate this guy. I want them to hate this guy or this guy they're going to love and fully trust. You could get the complete opposite out of the players because of the way you present it and you'll never change their mind. So I try not to do that. I try to just present characters at this um, shallow level, right? Because the players don't know these NPCs. So they are going to only know their depth, you know, in a very shallow sense and only in getting to know them after a while will they really know them. So I don't need to flesh out this giant background and everything they've been through before and how they got here and why they should be completely hated. And that's the same approach I take with the world. There's no sense in fleshing out all the gods and all this stuff, stuff that may never ever come up or the players may just completely disregard or not care about at all. What was, I put all that work in and it's not even being used or it's just being read the completely different way than I anticipated. So I don't, that's exactly why I really prefer this method of world building of campaign building essentially okay well i think i've pretty much covered everything i wanted to here i i feel like it was very wordy and this is longer than i wanted it to be but at the same time this is a pretty big subject hence breaking it up in kind of two parts here um and i hope that you've got something from it if nothing else just to answer the question well how does weem do his campaigns because <laughs> i definitely get get questions about that and i like to ask other people too not not from a sense of like i need help in knowing what to do it's just interesting to hear how other people do it and that's why i'm uh, really largely why i'm presenting this is because i've been asked and and i just like sharing this stuff just like i like hearing it so but you know maybe there's some ideas in there for you if you haven't tried a bottom up approach or if that seemed intimidating you know how do you start from nothing hopefully this gives you some insight you know and some actual you know um, examples of how someone who does it that way makes that work i know it can be intimidating kind of this blank sheet if you imagine sitting at the table with players who are making characters and you know nothing about the world at the at the same time they're rolling dice for their attributes you're like i know nothing about the world that sounds really intimidating but you really just start small you know you start really small and what's really close to the characters and you will figure out the rest as you go with them and it's and it can be a lot of fun it's it's it can be intimidating at times but it's trust me it's it's a lot of fun um so anyway i do want to thank you guys for watching this um and the first part if you got through that one as well i really appreciate it. if you have any feedback on this video i would love to hear it down in the comments was this too long was it too wordy did i just ramble on too much if you had any questions about any of this let me know or a question about anything really let me know in the comments uh, I'm really looking for, you know, questions or topics just in general, stuff that interests me. So you may mention something that I say, oh, that's cool. I actually want to talk about that and make a video on it. So anything you guys want to talk about. I do want to mention that there is a Discord that I've set up for the channel here to talk about these kinds of things, not just my videos or topics, but really anything. Um, if you know nothing about D&D and just want to know, jump in the Discord and I'll help fill you in on <laughs> what that what it is if you know nothing about the game. I know there are a number of people here coming here from my um, larger video game YouTube channel, a number of people who really don't know anything about the game. And if that's you, then the Discord, I think, is a good place for you if you want to know more about the game. But um, anyway, thanks again for watching. As always, I really appreciate it, and I'll catch you next time.